thank you very much uh, for, for, for inviting me, for um, giving me the opportunity to tell you about uh, uh, Coriovalum, uh, the, the small Roman town uh, only 70 kilometers uh, west of, of Cologne. And um, yeah, I look forward to, to giving this talk to you in this way. And hopefully next time it will be possible to come to England, of course, because that would be even better. Uh, the Roman baths, as you uh, uh, see them here, uh, uh, oh, I, I can hear someone. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, yes, so here you can see the Roman uh, baths of Heerlen in the museum as they look uh, nowadays. Um, this was how they looked in 1941 when they were just excavated. And as you can see, they lie right in the middle of the current day town of Heerlen. And it's actually quite uh, a, a, a miracle that they survived so well because uh, Heerlen was a booming mining town. And from 1890 onwards, it was just building, building, building. And they managed to build just around the bath and the, the field under which the, the baths were hidden remained intact until 1940. So the, uh, the, 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 as, as uh, David just said, we did a complete reassessment of the baths, of the interpretation of the baths. And uh, the, the main uh, event leading up to this was this large scale restoration of the baths which were carried out between 2017 and 2019. It involved a huge cleaning operation, uh, sucking all the dirt away, but also with a steam cleaner, as you can see, uh, top right hand corner. And uh, we consolidated the walls uh, and we even did some reconstruction of damaged areas such as uh, a nice vault uh, structure you can see on the left and uh, and on the right down. Uh, we even reconstructed parts of a, a terrazzo uh, border around the large uh, wall uh, floor. I'm sorry. And so this publication was uh, uh, came out about three days before the Netherlands went into lockdown, um, and this. Uh, work presents the results of this uh, reappraisal of everything that was found in and around the Roman bath sites. First, I would like to show you uh, where exactly is Heerlen, because I can imagine that for most of you, it's not very evident. Well, we are here. This is Heerlen. And as you can see, uh, Cologne is to the, to the east only 70 kilometers. We're pretty much on the same level as Folkestone, uh, Brussels. And uh, we are in the province, the Dutch province of Limburg, which is very much, an, it's almost non-Dutch like. As you can see, we are bordered by, uh, we are enclosed by Germany and by Belgium. And uh, yes, it's a, it's a very different part of the Netherlands. Of course, in the Roman period, we were part of the large province of Germania Inferior, and we belonged to the Civitas Traianensis. More about that later. Interestingly, uh, this bit of the Netherlands is one of the highest bits of the Netherlands. And we, uh, as you can see, we are here, and the landscape here is hilly. We call them the Dutch mountains. Uh, but it's, uh, it's hill-like, and uh, not only that, but there are other, um, other specific uh, elements to this landscape that are unique to the Netherlands. For example, the large-scale loam soils that we have here. And on the map on the left, and the little star indicates where Heerlen is, you can see with the orange color where this large band of loess soil, loam soils is located. And you can see that north of us and south of us, the, you don't have this soil. And of course, it's one of the most fer fertile soils. And it's also very easy to work under as good uh, conditions, not too wet or not too dry. 
it's very, very uh, fertile ground. It has always been used by farmers in the past. The earliest farmers in Europe uh, seeked out these loam soils. And in Roman times, it was very much a treasure uh, because of course the possibilities for large scale agriculture. Another important element to the uh, Limburg landscape is the natural occurrence of limestone. And not uh, the interesting thing is you don't even have to dig deeper. It's, it's open air quarries uh, that enable, in this case, the Romans to, to get their hands on this limestone. We actually have two types. One type is more, uh, more suitable uh, to make uh, the Roman concrete, uh, the, the cimentum. And the other type, which you can see here, is uh, very strong and it can be used as building uh, material. And the baths, for example, were made completely from this particular type of land, uh, limestone. Uh, and this is the quarry where the Romans got the limestone for the baths. So if we look at the map uh, in the Roman period, and you can see the, uh, the Rhine River and the Meuse River, and uh, has several smaller areas. And you can see that Heerlen, together with Maastricht, Jülich and Aachen, uh, lie in the hinterland of the Roman Limes. There we go. You see, here we have another look. And uh, interestingly, uh, the, in orange, we see the, the, the smaller Roman roadside settlements uh, that I just mentioned. Uh, we, and none of us have an official municipium uh, sta uh, status, certainly not in the, in the first uh, two centuries of, of the Roman period. But we are, all uh, we are all definitely urban centers and we are connected by two main Roman roads going from east to west, the so-called Via Belgica, and going uh, sort of south, east to northwest, another Roman road that we call the Via Traiana. So Corio Vallenben in the past was seen as a tiny little settlement. And uh, the map, uh, the, the, the your, black and white. Joined with audio. Well, I did that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the black and white uh, map that you see uh, yeah, shows a very tiny built area. And uh, the interpretation of the remains uh, was done in the 80s or on the right hand corner. And you can see it, it's, it's a tiny, very idyllic little town. And of course, the main question is, is this the real Coriovalum or are we looking at something completely different? Well, to uh, look at this map, uh, you can already see this is the bathhouse. And uh, you can see all these triangles. Those are all uh, remains of pottery kilns. Um, they, are, they are literally everywhere. And uh, the remains of houses are found everywhere in this larger red circle. So immediately we can say Coriolanum was a lot bigger than that little dot, uh, the, 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 the little area indicated. Furthermore, there are four burial fields, each located alongside the main Roman roads, and uh, two or three of them are, are nearly a kilometer. This also indicates the size of the town. Well, it all starts for Coriovalum, of course, uh, with the invasion by the Romans uh, at the middle of the first century BC. And I always uh, show this this image to, uh, view, uh, to, to when I pr uh, give a presentation to indicate the violent nature of the start of the Roman uh, period in our particular part of the world. And uh, most people have uh, the tendency to idolize the Romans, but of course it just uh, started violently uh, as depicted in this wonderful movie, Gladiator. And these two men were the main responsible ones uh, Julius Caesar, and, uh, who conquered all of Gaul, including the area which he called Belgica, uh, to which our area belonged, with the inhabitants or the Eburones, 
and he even claimed that he, he, he killed them all because they uh, revolted against him. If that is true or not remains to be seen, but the fact is that the name Eburones is never heard of, seen of again in epigraphy, whereas other names of Germanic tribes that were brought to the area by Augustus uh, do survive. So apparently uh, the Eburones, the original uh, native inhabitants did perish. And so Augustus uh, um, uh, followed Julius Caesar. And one of the important things to, uh, to state is that he was, uh, Julius Caesar is so famous for the Gallic Wars and Augustus tried to conquer the Germanic area west east of the Rhine for almost 30 years. And to do this, he built this big army, uh, about, about, or, or, oh, I'm sorry, I can't get the word out. He basically built a war machine. Every red dot that you see here is a legion camp. So at least 5,000 men. And uh, we even have uh, some additional camps uh, during the, the first uh, decade of the conquest along the Lippe River, because that's a nice natural valley. So we have even more Roman soldiers here. So we have estimated um, that about 50,000 Roman soldiers were planted alongside the, the Rhine and the Lippe with the sole purpose of uh, subjecting uh, the Germanic tribes on the right hand side. Of course, this went terribly wrong. Uh, 9 AD, the Varus Schlacht, uh, three legions were completely slaughtered. But uh, yeah, oh, this is just to show you uh, how if, uh, we have one of the, the temporary camps, Haltern, very famous alongside the Lippe, which you can see flowing there, and Vetera, which, la which lay exactly at the point where the Lippe River flows into the Rhine. You even had a double legion camp there. So 10 to 12,000 soldiers lived here. We have veterans in Coriovallum. We have this wonderful stone that was found already in 1870 in the Southern Roman burial field. And it says in, in inscription, it's a, it's a stone that weighs nearly 600 kilos. And it's a very specific uh, natural stone, which is uh, uh, from a military quarry in the North of France. And it says, Marcus Julius, son of Marcus, and he is Missus Lech, and then the V for five. So he's a veteran of the Fifth Legion, which was a very famous uh, legion because it was created by Julius Caesar from loyal Gallic troops. You can see he doesn't have a tree nomen. He has two names and he adds a third one, but it's not an official name. And he's called Marcus Julius. So he's called after Julius, the person who gave the Gallic tribe uh, the possibility to, to form their own legion. And also very importantly, this legion was disbanded after the Batavian revolt. So we know that this is a very early Roman uh, burial stone. And uh, of course, this indicates that the earliest uh, inhabitants of Goriophallum had quite a big connection to the military. I wouldn't go as far as to say that Koryovalum was a, a military camp. This was claimed in the past, but I think it's more to do with the fact that you have a lot of veterans that are settled uh, in and around the town. We can also see this in other material. For example, uh, we have a lot of terra sigillata, Samian ware with the name of the owner inscribed in it in the grafito. We have hundreds of them. Uh, we have specific uh, fibulae, such as the famous Aukissa here in the middle, but also the two to the right, we, that are, they are very specific Gallic uh, fibulae that you don't find uh, often in any uh, military context. So here you can see that sort of Gallic military uh, character coming through. Uh, if we look at the coins, we have the famous Nemausus 
coins and also the, uh, the altar on the left, uh, which indicates that things really started happening at around the time of August. And the, the main start for the settlement is the construction of the Roman road, the main Roman road. Here you can see an artist's impression of this road. And this is the road which we call the Via Belgica. We don't know its exact name, but it runs right through at, uh, north of France, southeast of Belgium, and then right through the middle of uh, South Limburg to the Rhine, to Cologne. And of course, this was used in this very first uh, period, the conquest area and subsequent uh, um, building uh, the Limes area. Uh, for getting stuff to these soldiers, 50,000 Roman soldiers. They need shoes, they need weapons, they need food first and foremost. And these Gallic uh, farmers that used to live in the area, uh, in the Lust area, because the light color that you see here is the Lust uh, loam soils, they were all uh, apparently uh, slaughtered by Julius Caesar. So who was going to get these people their food and north? Uh, of the area. It's very swampy. You have on the one hand very sandy soils and then of course the river delta that's completely swampy. So you, it's very unsuitable for uh, arable farming. Uh, so to get this straight line, this, this uh, basically uh, it's like a, a high-speed railroad for the Romans to get everything to these army camps alongside the Rhine like this. So this is what we call ground zero, the start of Coriovalum. And I will uh, show you this type of map because, the, as I said before, uh, a lot of what I will tell you today is based on the results of this uh, reassessment of all the finds found in and around the bathhouse and especially the, the excavation of the area around the baths. And here you can see uh, that we have this interesting building in the top right hand corner. We look, take a closer look. You can see uh, how we see a lot of, we see ditches and we see very nice square post holes. And what is it? I mean, if you look at the size, you can see it's quite big. This is not a regular house in any shape or form. And if you look at this and then compare it to this, we think that this is a mancio, so uh, mancio or statio, basically uh, an, an outpost. And of course, I've stolen the nice reconstruction picture from the internet because it's a, actually a, a British site. I'm not sure which one actually. Here you see also the famous uh, combination of having a mancio or statio together with a bathhouse, because of course the whole purpose of Amancio was to provide to Roman travelers, especially uh, with goods for the army, with coins from uh, uh, Lyon, Lugdunum, and to offer them a safe spot for the night and give them a, a bath and some good food before they go on to the next uh, stop. And so we think that the start of Coriovalum lies in this kind of construction, a Roman road with Amancio. So Tiberius uh, sort of uh, was important for our region because he decided enough with these Germanic wars. Uh, Drusus uh, did reach the Elbe, apparently, but died on the way back. And then Tiberius said, forget it. We're going to put uh, the Limes here on the Rhine. So this is where the soldiers are staying. These camps, no, forget about it. And this situation continued pretty much until the very end of the Roman period for our region. The next emperor who was very important for our region was the emperor Claudius, because in 50 AD, he founded the very first colonia in this new Ger Germany, in this new uh, uh, Germanic uh, province. It wasn't a province yet, it was just like a, a, a conquest area. It is the Cl Colonia Claudia Ara Agrippinensis. Uh, so he founded it, but it was a, basically a gift for his wife, Agrippina, 
who was raised there in a military camp that was formerly there. And you can see it's, uh, it's an exquisite little Rome uh, on the Rhine and most of current day Cologne, the inner city, is very much in this uh, direction. And, and you can see the Roman town if you look closely. <laughs> so, but in Heerlen, uh, under, uh, we think just after Emperor Claudius or just before it, we get this, the first phase of the Roman bathhouse. And it's a very simple one, as you can see. Nevertheless, it's got everything you would want. Uh, here we see it from the west. It does have an enclosed outer area for sports. On the other side, you can see also a small area. And this is from above. And you can see it's uh, definitely from the line type. So all the heated, all, all the, the, the different rooms of the bathhouse are in one line. If we start at the front, we have the apoditerium, which is the large uh, um, um, room to get changed. Uh, you, you enter here, you pay, but more importantly, because it is ridiculously big, if you look at this plan, you can see it's a really, really large area. And also, if you look at the floor, it has this wonderful, uh, uh, yeah, little, uh, it's completely made of little uh, tile uh, bricks, little big bricks in a nice uh, fish pattern, but it's, it's not a spectacular mosaic. This is a heavy duty floor and it was probably made this way because they were doing sports inside. I don't know if you know that, but uh, the first phase of bathing is doing sports, is exercising. You put oil on yourself and then you do sports, you wrestle, you sword fight, you do all kinds of things that makes you really hot and sweaty. And that's the start of the bathing process. It is definitely the Roman way of bathing and certainly the way of active Romans, for example, military men who have to stay in shape. The second room, is actually the one that you don't, you, when you have just done sports, you go right through it uh, on your way to the heated room. But this is the frigidarium, the room with cold water. And uh, through the wonderful study of Gemma Janssen, who studied the water system, we now know that the cold water baths were overflowing constantly during the day and the water would disappear into these little there are tiles with big holes in them and underneath runs this beautiful uh, little uh, drain and takes all the water away. So uh, everything here has has been laid in, in, in watertight uh, concrete. If you go through this open door here, oh no, sorry, if you go through the little door that you see uh, at just in front of you, you come into the Laconicum. And this is what David just mentioned earlier. We have a circular laconicum. And uh, this must have been a dry heat area because the underground heating was not as such that, it, that you would get like really, really hot. Uh, you would need an additional source of heat and there is no hot water in this room at all. It's just a dry heat, very much like our sauna today. And uh, this is the tepidarium, the tepid room, which was probably used for massages and is basically uh, a transition room because of course in a building like this, you cannot have the very hot room next to the very cold room. This is then the, at the heart of the bathhouse, the caldarium. And again, you can see a large bath that is constantly overflowing and the water that the hot water that flows onto the floor is then uh, evaporating because the floor here is very very hot because we're closest to the prefernium and where the where the fire were burning to to heat the water and to provide the whole bathhouse of hot air in the in the in the heated rooms and so this would be a steam room and just in front here we have a so-called labrum. Labrum is uh, 
a big bowl made of natural stone filled with cold water. And as I said earlier, yeah, you have your first thing to do is, is you do sports and you're sweaty and maybe you've fallen on the ground a couple of times and there's dirt on you. And then you walk in to the caldarium with its hot, humid air. You take out your strigilis, your scraper, and standing here at the wash basin, at the labrum, you scrape off the oil and all the dirt and you uh, you throw it on the floor and then you spatter your face and only then can you go into the hot water bath. Another look at how that might have looked. And uh, yeah, the, all these reconstructions were done by someone who is uh, he's not even an, ar uh, an archaeologist, um, but he works with software that they use nowadays to make uh, and, uh, to make all these video games. Um, and so you can see you get wonderful results. Uh, the colors are based on actual finds of uh, fresco material. And the, the bathhouse, this virtual bathhouse is located in exactly the same orientation uh, that the baths are. So the sunshine and everything. It's, it's, so we now have our virtual reality Roman bathhouse uh, for all the different phases, by the way. So here we have another look at the bathhouse and you can see uh, that it's very, yeah, it's, it's all built in one line and there's even uh, some interesting uh, um, symmetry because there's a, a wall here on the left that was later used uh, in the second phase and uh, the distance from the center of the bathhouse to this wall is exactly the same distance as you have to this line which is in the second phase also uh, repurposed. So of course symmetry is uh, something that's very characteristic of Roman building and you can find it here as well. So we think definitely that in this phase it's the Roman presence that is uh, that is behind building this bath. I mean who is using the bathhouse in this phase? It is probably the Neronic period uh, so just after Claudius, in any case, it's uh, everything between 60 and 70 AD. And uh, who is using these baths? Not the Germanic tribes that are living there. Uh, certainly not uh, the poor farmers. It's probably uh, Roman uh, officials, Roman military, Roman veterans. Right. So here we can also see how they... Uh, Took care of the drainage system which, uh, with an under earth uh, drain and they actually made use of the natural uh, lie of the land which is lower on the west side than on the right hand side. Some nice pieces of plumbing. We have a lead pipe that was probably uh, in, in, located in one of the baths. Uh, left hand corner we have two wash basins made again of this very specific uh, white limestone from a military quarry in the north of France, which is uh, Norois. And so this again is a, a possible link with the military. And below is something even better. I was told by our water specialist that there's only three sites in the whole of the Roman Empire where remains of the big boiler were found. And Roman is the, uh, and Heerlen is the fourth site. And here you can see how they used part of the boiler and they repaired it, so they repurposed it. But on the drawing you can see that there was uh, there was decoration on this lead. And we have four uh, huge slabs of this uh, lead boiler. And uh, so it's actually an amazing find. It doesn't look like much, but it's actually quite spectacular. During this first phase of the bathhouse, and some development also took place north of the building. We still have our Manzio, but to the left of it, we get the construction of this type of houses, very specific Roman roadside houses. They are quite narrow, very elongated with workshops in the front and uh, usually gardens in the back. And here you can see that. Um, and so in green, you have the Manzio, and then these uh, in orange, yellow, and light green, we have three of these houses. 
and you can see that they don't line up perfectly. They are sort of in a, in a, located in a V shape. Yeah, sorry, this. So you get something like this. This is from another uh, Roman roadside settlement, but, but this is the idea behind these kind of settlements that everybody wanted to take advantage of a good position with all these travelers coming by every day, all hours of the day. And you get tradesmen, you get artisan production, and Corio uh, Fallen very much developed like that as well. In the Pax Romana period, then, uh, when it was after the Batavian Revolt, uh, we get a prosperous period also in Corio Fallen, and something changes. The, 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 the dominant factor uh, of the, uh, the dominant presence of, of the military in, in, in fine material is very much diminished and we start to see the civilians of Corio Fallen. Um, an important decision by, um, uh, by uh, uh, I think it was, uh, yeah, by, by Domitian was to declare of, uh, for official the, the province of Germania Inferior and Germania Superior, and Germania Inferior being uh, the lower lying uh, Germany with the, with the capital of Colonia Claudia Ara Agrippinensis. And uh, the, it remained this capital well, uh, just until uh, Trier became uh, the new cap uh, capital of the West Roman Empire. And Heerlen being located only three days travel, uh, west of this main town, of course, was in prime location. It is definitely influenced what happened in the town. This emperor was uh, very crucial for the development of Coriovalum. Uh, Trajan, uh, Trajan was actually an officer, uh, high ranking, of course, and he served in the army camp Vetera. I would already mentioned, which was a, a double legion camp later became a regular legion camp. But in 105 AD, he founded Colonia Upia Traiana, the second colonia, the only two colonias in the province, Germania Inferior, and again, a very much a little Rome, as you can see. And so interestingly, if we look at this map, uh, Heerlen belonged to the Kivitas Traianensis, which uh, uh, Colonia Ubia Traiana as its capital. It did not belong to the Kivitas uh, with Cologne as the main town, the Kivitas Agrippinensis. And this is because, and we have to rely on uh, historical sources here, um, uh, uh, Emperor August had taken all these loyal Germanic tribes uh, during his reign and put them in this border area, the Batavians, uh, the Kanenefate, the Ubiers, uh, and several tribes, and also he uh, he asked to come over the Kugerni and the Baitasi, and the Kugerni and the Baitasi he apparently were related. The Baitasiers were sort of a sub tribe of the Kugerni, and the Kugerni were located in the area around Xanten. And then the Baitasiers were apparently located below them, but they still sort of formed one uh, Kivitas. And this is why I think personally that Coriovalum was uh, probably the main town for these Baitasiers. They are known uh, to have been uh, active in Roman service. Apparently Nero had uh, a lifeguard, uh, bodyguards uh, from these Be uh, Betasian uh, troops. So not Batavian, but Betasiers. And uh, of course, a lot of archeologists do not agree with this line of thinking that you cannot rely on these sources, but I think there's something to say for it when you look at the evidence in Coriovalum. So yeah, Coriovalum is located at this crossroad and directly connected to both colonia in this way. And then this happens. They enlarge the baths at the beginning of the second century AD. And so this is what it would have looked like from the outside. So what they do, they take the existing bath, 
and they basically build a big thing around it, but they don't do anything with the bathhouse itself. It's very clever. Uh, the front side used to be 12 meters and they enlarge it to become 48 meters. So they enlarge it by four. And all of a sudden, and you can see that here, you have a very impressive building. And also uh, on the left and the right, uh, they, uh, so they built these portiki. And the interesting thing is you don't need much building material and you don't need much knowledge to enlarge the site like this. The bathhouse itself is a very technical building, very difficult to get right with the water supply and the hot air flow. But this is very easy. So here on the west side, you get this nice big palestra, very Roman looking with a swimming pool. And you can walk in the, under the porticus. Uh, you can sit there, you can uh, rest between taking baths. You can look at what happens. And uh, we even have these two, uh, on both sides, these triclinie, where yeah, a very proper uh, Roman way you can sit and you can eat. And then on the other side, another palestra is added. And here we have, interestingly, this palestra is a, a lot smaller. And so the, the layout is not symmetrical. And this we think is uh, partly due to the fact that the town had already grown a bit. So they didn't have unlimited uh, areas to build on, on the, on the east side of the bathhouse. So this is a smaller, uh, smaller palestra with uh, less sunshine, but we have these little uh, shop tabernae, uh, three of them, which are an integral part of the bathhouse. Probably in the, the first one you could buy food and the second one, probably uh, everything you needed to take a bath, a, a scraper, bath oil, etc., slippers. And the third one was probably uh, a, a practitioner, a doctor, because we know uh, looking at the material that was found, especially uh, everything iron, that operations were carried out here, uh, not specifically in this little taberna, but in the bathhouse. And a, a bathhouse is so much more than a big bathroom. It is very much a health center. Okay? You do sports, you eat, uh, you take these different types of bath, uh, for example, uh, humid air is good for your lungs, whereas the hot, dry air is good for your muscles. And uh, so apparently they even did operations and they could provide you with all sorts of ointments and, and then everything to cure aches and pains. If we look then outside of the bathhouse, so you can see uh, here the, the plan with the, all, the, all the, the stone walls. And this is where we go from more post-built uh, structures to definitely more stone-built structures. And our manzio in the top uh, right corner is now suddenly made of stone, as you can see in the picture here on the right. Uh, the layout is different, but it's still a very big building, very large rooms, as you can see, almost at 10 by eight meters. That's not your average little bedroom or living room. So, and it has a nice porticus on the front. So, and uh, unfortunately this excavation was done in the fifties with sometimes dodgy uh, documentation. So uh, sometimes it's very impossible to see. We think that the building may have extended even uh, more towards the North, but further research would have to uh, point that out. But here, we start to see these houses in stone in the previous phase. It was post-built houses, and now you have this pretty much the same shape, but now you have these proper stone-built townhouses with cellars, as you can see here in the, in, in, in the center, and several rooms, and it's pretty much this kind of housing. This is another example of Coriopalum, uh, a house of Coriopalum, just uh, 50 meters to the west of the bathhouse. And again, you see these wonderful cellars. And the idea is that every house had a cellar in the, at, the, at the beginning of the second century. We start to see, when we look at the burial fields, uh, definitely an elite forming, uh, uh, an elite presence. We have some uh, very rich burials with uh, stone uh, 
uh, incendiary urns, as you can see here, two examples, filled to the brim with goodies from uh, uh, all kinds of material. A lot of this material is not even in our museum, but it's in the National Museum, like you have your British Museum, we have our uh, State Museum of Antiquity in Leiden, and uh, a lot of these really precious uh, objects are part of their collection now because they were sold when they were found in 1920. This is a very special. Yes. So we definitely see this elite uh, arising. And interestingly, we have epigraphical evidence that these people are not properly Romans. They have Germanic names. They are called Amulva and Haldavo, and they even they depict themselves very much as uh, natives. The women have uh, this very distinct uh, hairdo, which is typical for uh, female uh, tribe members in the Rhine area, uh, which you can also see if you know the matrona goddesses. Uh, they have this very specific type of hairstyle with a shawl around it, probably. And this is second century AD, so it's very interesting to see that the, these people are still identifying as uh, Germanic, uh, maybe Beta, Betasian, whereas they would have definitely been, being the elite, uh, part of the Roman world. Something is happening to my lamp here. I think something is detaching. So if it all falls down, I have to jump up and save it, but I'll just continue talking. Anyway, to the right of the bathhouse, we have in, uh, identified this specific, very specific uh, little building, also made of a stone foundation. We can see these, oh, sorry, these uh, square, uh, squares in the front, indicative possibly of uh, uh, foundations for pillars. And this could possibly be something like this. And we haven't really found, uh, we have some indications of further temples, but of course a temple is a public building. It used to be uh, assumed in, in the recent past that the bathhouse was the only public building in Corbeofalum. If we add some temples, now you're getting somewhere. So that is very interesting to me, of course, to be able to assess the proper character of Corbeofalum. Is it just a Roman roadside settlement with a nice bathhouse? Or is it more of a proper town with more public buildings? more of an official town possibly. And we have uh, already identified uh, several type of columns, uh, which the specialist uh, uh, told us that these were types of columns that you would only find in public buildings. And we have four different types. And he says, well, that's four different buildings because every building has just one specific type of pillar. So as the story continues, then the puzzle is not solved yet. Uh, what is also very specific of Heerlen is its pottery production. And thanks to the research by uh, Julie van Kerkhoven, Belgian, uh, she, she's Dutch, uh, originally from Belgium. She's a pottery specialist and she studies not just the shape, but also the material, the clay, uh, using uh, electronic uh, microscope. And because the clay used by the potters in Coriolanum is very recognizable, it's very typical because when you bake it, it remains white. Uh, she has been able to identify based only on looking at the different types of pots found in and around the bath, uh, the an, an Heerlen production of Roman pottery of nearly 190 different types, beakers, plates, jugs, everything. And this start also very interesting, uh, somewhere uh, in the middle of the first century. So possibly coincides with building the first phase of the bathhouse, with, because a bathhouse, of course, is a center of consumption. People eat, people drink, and you get bars around it. You can probably get a lot of uh, taverns, uh, inns there. And uh, yeah, you need plates and cups and, 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 and everything because uh, something falls on the ground and you're back to square one. So you get this huge pottery production. We have found over uh, 50 uh, different 
uh, uh, kilns already, and now this large number of uh, nearly 200 specific Heerlen types, uh, yeah, it's starting to look very interesting. So this, we think, would have been the scene outside of the bathhouse, the bathhouse to the right, and then looking out on these uh, stone houses with the, the Manzio, we probably have uh, have bone working, we have bakery, we have butcher, uh, we have we had a specialist look at all the bone material and uh, she could she gave she gave some very interesting she drew some very interesting conclusions about uh, that butchery going on uh, bakery we have uh, very large uh, kiln stones so uh, millstone sorry uh, which apparently points to a more industrial production rather than a domestic production. And outside of town, we have this villa landscape developing. In the first century, we have small farms, mostly post-built, but in this, uh, starting in, in the second century, we see that uh, in, these, in these farmer settlements, you get suddenly these big uh, Roman style main houses. Most of the, the other structures were still post-built or partly stone, partly uh, posts, but it of course looks very Roman and uh, we think definitely uh, veterans, but also uh, possibly just uh, had a native population who are becoming more and more Roman, not just in the way they dress in what they eat, but also very specifically in how they are involved in agricultural production for the market. These uh, uh, settlements are not as palatial as uh, you would find in the south of England or for example in the south of France or in Italy. These are very much working farms. Interesting is the, the, this, the, the rectangular shape of the, of the yard uh, with one stone building in the middle but flanked by other buildings that are usually uh, not made with stone, but simply with posts. And uh, around it, you have the fields for uh, wheat, but also animal production, of course, uh, sheep, cow, pigs, everything. And then it's, uh, it, it all takes a turn for the worst. I, I found this today and I thought it was very, uh, very uh, uh, suitable because uh, I usually refer to this period at the start of the third phase as uh, the Game of Thrones phase because it all starts going really, really badly already. Uh, you can see here the Germanic Wars of 180 AD. You have some Germanic tribes uh, crossing the Rhine and uh, uh, yeah, making life very hard for the Roman troops. But it goes really pear-shaped in 256, seven, uh, early seven, when uh, a, a group of Germanic tribes that call themselves the Franks uh, breach the limes, the, 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 the line defense system of the Romans along the Rhine, somewhere between Xanten and Cologne. And they, uh, they, they, they basically just you start using the roads and very rapidly they, they enter deeply into the Roman Empire and apparently uh, it's only in somewhere in Spain that they can be stopped. Well, this event has turned, uh, turns out to be catastrophic for the area, of course. Uh, in, in fact, most of the Dutch Limes area from Nijmegen to Katwijk uh, near, near the sea, uh, seems to sort of be abandoned. Not very much happens in the late Roman period. A, a town like uh, Forum Adriani see, almost ceases to exist. Uh, it's different for Coriolanum. In Coriolanum, uh, just as every other major town alongside the Via Belgica uh, gets a defensive system in uh, Maastricht, in Aachen, in, uh, in Cologne and in Xanten. They basically remodel the town, usually a much smaller area, and they build it into a big fortress. And we don't know if this is the result of the 
army reorganization that happens in the second century of the third, in, a, in the second half of the third century. Uh, but we know that it happens everywhere. Also, uh, Tongres, Liberci, if you go into Belgium, everywhere you see that these Roman roadside towns, uh, yeah, they start to get defensive structures. And the bathhouse in Corriofalum becomes part of the defensive system, as you can see here. So what they seem to do, what they, well, yeah, we, we can, we can only guess, but what, what, what it looks like is that they may, uh, uh, they do not make big stone walls like they do in other towns, but they have a big ditch and wall system and they use the structure of the bathhouse on three sides to have made part of this fortress. It's actually yeah, really easy. And then they uh, extend it towards the east. Uh, in, uh, in, in the meantime, they also completely rebuilt the bathhouse. As you can see, this was uh, the, the, the first uh, uh, center, the, the, sorry, the first building with the first uh, layout. And then they remodeled them and you get a completely different layout. We even get a new uh, entrance hall slash dressing room in green. And uh, instead of one, we get two uh, lukewarm rooms. Here you can see that again, the swimming pool is completely abandoned. Uh, the old furnace on the south is also completely abandoned. And instead, uh, it, with the red squares, they break open parts of the building and make new, new uh, heating systems for the rooms. And interestingly, we seem to know who has done this because we have this beautiful stone that was found on the side of the bathhouse. And it says, first of all, uh, you have the dedication to Fortuna. And then we have a name, M for Marcus, and then a Satonius, and just part of the I here, and Dus, and the epigraphist has uh, reconstructed this as Eucundus. So we have a Marcus Satonius Eucundus, very Roman name, and he is in fact member of the DEC, the, de the, de the, the Ordo Decurionem, so he's a decurio, uh, uh, a council person from CUT, from Colonia Upia Traiana. This, of course, this stone reinforces uh, the fact or proves the fact that Coriovalum belonged to the Kivitas ruled by Colonia Upia Traiana. But this man was a, a, a yeah, council man from Coriovalum in Colonia Upia Traiana. And he, Balneo, restituted. He restored the bathhouse. And the double S is not a mistake. It's actually uh, common uh, for, uh, uh, it's the common way to write restituted in the late Roman period. Also, interestingly, Sato in Satonius is a Germanic name. I already called, uh, I already mentioned uh, the Haldavo name. And Sato is also very much a Germanic name, but it's, it's been made into a Roman name. So here we have in the late Roman period, someone with Germanic origins, and a, a town official, an important person, and he restores the bath. And yeah, they need to do a lot to, for that. And so here you can see a reconstruction of how they broke open one of the nice apses on the west and uh, gave the new smaller caldarium its own heating, uh, heating place. And then also the round laconicum was also broken open and was also given its own little furnace. And here on, uh, we, you can see that, yeah, it's, it's hard to see, but they, uh, they divide the old caldarium. They actually, uh, may, they close off the back room, the, the back bath, and then they build a new bath close to the new furnace. And then here, you can see in the East Palestra that they build a new um, entrance area, a new apoditerium. 
So, of course, this outer area would hardly have been used anymore. And uh, probably this new apoditerium is very simple. Uh, we can see the brickwork was not very well done. The mortar is in bad shape. Uh, so they actually use this tiny little uh, area to break, they break it through. We can see that here. Uh, they break through the, the wall. They cut through the mortar. And you can see also that they put on the floor of the frigidarium a new tile area. And you can see a nice mosaic underneath here. That was from the first phase. So in the later phase, they uh, add this new la layer of tiles. And if you look very closely here in the front, you can see how these big tiles are worn down completely, probably by the many feet that enter here. Because we think in this last phase, the bathhouse was still in use probably almost two centuries. And uh, here you can see an another example how in the cold room, uh, they, they tiled over the entire uh, room um, with these big uh, ceramic tiles. But here in the corner, there was probably a basin or something that they didn't manage to rip out. And so when it was eventually uh, excavated, you can see the remains of the original nice uh, mosaic from the first phase with black and white tiles, uh, little stones. And so here in the what in the East Palestra, so for six of the, the 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 foundations for the pillars, they did a renewal. And you can see that here even better. So how completely at the bottom, you can see uh, the original foundation and that is reinforced uh, at, at a specific time, possibly during the enlargement. And then you get a layer of rubble. You can see bits of roof tile and some natural stones. And then this big block is placed on top. And the block, of course, is a spolia. It's a stone that was used uh, in another function somewhere else beforehand. And it was taken to the site and even remodeled a bit to be used as the new foundation block for a pillar. So this is the plan. And you can see in the dark green, the V-shaped defensive ditch, and then possibly a small palestra on the east side. You can see uh, the different layout of the bath itself. Here you can see this V-shaped ditch. Uh, you can see where the little uh, the earthen stairs is going down. This is the V-shaped ditch. You can see it's enormous and it just goes right over all the different other structures in that period. Here you can see a cut through it. Uh, this is a drawing from 1954. And you can see it's absolutely massive. And uh, recently, uh, behind the bathhouse, on uh, in, as, uh, two streets away, uh, the continuation of this V-shaped ditch was unearthed. And it's something like five meters deep and nine meters tall. And it's just absolutely massive. And uh, interestingly, two new excavations uh, just behind the bathhouse have shown a so-called clavicula. So they showed that this V-shaped ditch uh, isn't a complete matchup, but it, it goes like what you can see on this drawing and you call it a clavicula. And it means that you, uh, you, you make a sort of a detour uh, at the road into the fortress or the defensive uh, system, makes a sort of a detour. And apparently this is quite an interesting thing and not really of, seen often. So we're very proud to have this. I don't know, maybe you know it from other sites in England. And uh, so this was possibly how it would have looked from uh, a V-shaped ditch uh, with uh, uh, an earth mound and then possibly some uh, wooden uh, fortifications on top. And so then basically now we, we come to the end of the bathhouse and the end of Coriovallum because uh, with, uh, unlike the rest of the Netherlands, uh, life continues after these uh, destructive uh, invasions by the Franks in 256, 57. Uh, but when the Roman Empire uh, falls, definitely the West Roman Empire falls definitely in uh, 476, this is the end of 
Corrie of Allen and the bathhouse as well. And uh, what's very interesting here, you see a little charcoal layer. Uh, it definitely indicates the last phase of use of the uh, already second uh, prefernium furnace uh, of the remodeled bathhouse and the C14 dating uh, yeah, demonstrated uh, late Roman period. So between four, 400 and 500. And we have a very late coin also from that area. So it seems that Coriolanum's fate, as it was tied to uh, the overall Roman uh, structure in Germania Inferior, uh, the fate of uh, Colonia uh, Claudia, uh, which had already gone down as soon as Trier became the new capital of the West Roman Empire, uh, it meant that when the ship went down, Coriolanum went down as well. So that is my presentation.